Hey everyone, this is Connor with the Aerospace Engineering Fellows, and let me tell you, we are getting to the good stuff. Uh, this is Astrodynamics. This is some of my favorite stuff, and um, you know, I can't. I, I'm excited for us to get further into this as the semester progresses. Uh, for now, we're gonna stick to the basics. All right. So what I have here is a quick video on the Keplerian elements. Uh, I know these are generally pretty easy to memorize, but I think it's good to think about them. Uh, less as just, you know, these six, these six numbers that define my orbit. I put it in my MATLAB code and it gives me a, an R and V vector. Uh, and start thinking about it intuitively. This will help you visualize things like, um, you know, transfers down the line. And, uh, you know, I think it's also just a, a good segue into uh, attitude dynamics because this really is a, this is, this is really an exercise in 3D, visual, 3D uh, spatial visualization. Anyway, let's get into it. So we are going to start with um, the first two orbital elements. Those are the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. These define the size and shape respectively. So SMA is what I like to use, and ECC, otherwise A and E. I'll move these out of the way, these arrows. These guys define how big our orbit is, right? And another way you can think about how big something is, so they, First of all, they define how big they are. You can think about how big an orbit is, also in terms of uh, the energy of the orbit. A bigger orbit, remember that we have a lot of, uh, we, we, we redefined potential energy for an orbit, right? So if we have zero potential energy along this line, we have negative infinity potential energy at a distance zero from an object, and then it tapers out with this 1 over r um, relationship. And if you take the partial of that, um, you'll get a 1 over r squared relationship, a negative 1 over r squared relationship, and that gives you the acceleration that's like that g m m over r squared that we're all so happy about, right? And it's towards the body negative direction. Put a little r hat there, right? So when you think about something being far away, something out here, right, we are going towards positive energy. We never reach positive potential energy, but we're going towards it. Um, and so as we're heading out there, you can, you can, think, you can think of a, a larger orbit as having um, uh, less negative energy, right? For an elliptical orbit, the energy is always negative. But the bigger you get, the less negative you get. All right, and so with that, I'm going to write out this guy right here. This is 2a. This is how big our orbit is. a equals semi-major axis. This has units of distance, and that's another key. You know, it's, it's distance. It's how, how much space does this take up, all right? Our next value is the eccentricity. And this is a pretty, uh, this is another pretty standard one. This tells us the shape for an elliptical orbit. This is the ratio of the difference in the perigee radius, RP, or periapse radius if it's not Earth, and the apoapse radius, RA. The ratio of the difference between those, so that's RA, nice and colorful, RP, divided by the sum of them. Looks like I'm running out of colors. Anyway, the sum of these is 2a, right? So this is the ratio of the distance here, effectively the distance here to the distance here, and kind of those two in relation to the size of, of the orbit. And that kind of tells us a few things. One, it tells us how wonky it is, right? The higher the eccentricity, the closer you get, you get to 1, the more flat we get. As we approach 1, we reach a, a parabolic orbit, and as we pass 1, we'll get a hyperbolic orbit, and that's when we kind of break our chains, right? We get something that's, that's just, too, um, just too stretched. As we approach 0, we start seeing a circular orbit, right? The ratio 
the difference between these is zero. If RA equals RP, we get zero eccentricity. I'll write that out right here. ECC equals this. Right? So let's define our size and our shape. Those are important for knowing things like, how fast is this thing going to go? If I have a really big orbit and a really small perigee radius, I know it's going to be blazing by down, uh, down at this perigee point, going really, really slow at apogee, uh, comparatively, compare, one compared to the other, and compared to the average speed. Whereas if I have a more circular orbit, I can infer that I'm not going to be dealing with too much variation in the speed of my object. Um, I'm not going to have too much difference in the, uh, you know, that implies I have different uh, time spent above different regions. So sometimes you'll have a high eccentricity as at your apogee, you'd like to spend a lot of time above a, a certain area. There's uh, the Indian or maybe it's the Japanese uh, GPS analog. They have high eccentricity. And they only turn it on, hmm, I might be thinking of the Indian constellation. They only turn them on over their country. And then they only, uh, they only use them, and they try to get them to spend as much time in that orbit above their country, right? And so that's just kind of, this, that's kind of the applications of when we think of size and shape, we can kind of imply some of the things that are going on, um, you know, behind the scenes, or there's, there's other things you can apply for that, right? Moving on, we're talking about orientation. So the orientation ones, these are the right ascension of the ascending node, the inclination, and the, well, let's be consistent, the argument of perigee. And I'm using these little acronyms because I think that they are a little more descriptive. They don't step on other uh, symbols' toes quite so much. I know A likes to get in there a lot. E likes to get in there. I likes to get in there. I makes a good iterator in your code. It's not great when you're using I for inclination and I for an iterator sometimes if you're doing some iterative solving. So I like to use these variables when I'm describing uh, things in code. They're very explicit, and they're very—they're uh, still pretty compact, right? Pretty universally understandable too. I guess that's what explicit means. So when I talk about orientation, I'm talking about—we already, you know, forget about how big it is, how what shape it is. We're talking about how this thing is tilted relative to some uh, inertial or otherwise predefined frame. Usually the frame we're talking about when we're talking about Earth-centered orbits are ECI coordinates. Those are denoted with the X, Y, and Z uh, coordinate, coordinate lines that we have here. And what we, what we have is these are basically a set of Euler angle rotations. So this is a 3, 1, 3 Euler rotation. All right. So if you've been in uh, aircraft dynamics, or if you're a little familiar with Euler, Euler angles, sometimes you think of them as, oh, that's roll, pitch, and yaw, or something like that, right? Well, that's only a very specific case of Euler angles. Euler angles are any combination of a three rotation, and you know, of, of a one, two, and three rotation, where one, two, and three are the first, second, and third axes of a coordinate frame. And if you have three of them, you can get from any orientation to any orientation. The way we've chosen to describe orbits is with a 3, 1, 3 with a rotation, right? So this first rotation, it's a 3 rotation. Our z-axis is our 3 axis. So we have a positive z rotation this way, right? And we rotate it to the right ascension of the ascending node, right? That's the, that's the first rotation in our system. And we know the right ascension of the ascending node is basically the part where if we have our, you know, our, our orbit direction right here. Our right ascension is where our um, orbit crosses, crosses lines in the upwards direction. It goes from the negative z to the positive z, or positive z on, the, on the z scale. And that gives us our first, first rotation. Our second rotation is a one rotation, right? So at this point, We'll draw our uh, our x y our x our x hat axis is our one, right? And when we do a rotation about our one, that's a rotation right here. We're doing positive about the x axis. This is our inclination, right? 
that's the another way to think about it, and I think sometimes it's described this way. It's the angle between the angular momentum vector, it should be a vector, and the z-axis, the inertial z-axis. You can think about it that way. I like thinking about it in terms of a rotation about the uh, z about the um, the new x hat axis, right? Um, but that's our second rotation. Our third rotation is another three rotation. So because we went, we had we were on intermediate axes right here. This is how Euler angles work. So this is our this x hat is our first intermediate axis. This z hat or h direction is our second intermediate axis. And now it's our new three uh, rotation axis. So now we have one last rotation about our three. And that's going to pull us from here up to, and it looks like here, yeah, here's y hat. And this is generally, called, sometimes called this theta. It depends on kind of your definition, or at least what you're looking at. So sometimes this is omega plus nu, where nu is the true anomaly, because the omega is the angle from your right ascension to your perigee location, and nu is in the same plane, in the same direction from your perigee location to where you are in the orbit. We'll talk about that as well. Sometimes we like to combine these. Sometimes it's useful to go all the way to wherever our, uh, our direction is. So for instance, right here, if we were making that last th three rotation out here, this would be omega, and then nu would be a negative value, so we would only rotate this far. And that would get us to where we want to be, right? One way to think about it, if you're just thinking about the orientation of the plane, I like to think that omega is good enough, and then if you'd like to go further, you can go further. And now we will go further. But first, when I say now we will go further, I mean we will do that after I explain this. First, we'll talk about what we're doing here. So we had a three rotation of the right ascension of the descending node. We had a one rotation about the, um, sorry, this is about the new three axis, or sorry, about the new one axis. We rotated by our inclination. And then we have another three rotation about our new intermediate three axis, which is just our orbit normal, our h direction, our z hat direction. And we rotated by ARP or ARP plus theta. Or, sorry, not theta. New. And I know sometimes you guys use a, a theta star. Same, th same thing. All right. That's how we get that's how we get the orientation of our plane. So now we have two tools. We have how big it is, which kind of tells us how fast it's going, um, what kind of uh, you know how much time is it spending in this regime versus this regime? Um, how long is it going to take to go all the way around total, right? That's how we get our period from how big it is. Our rotation tells us more about you know um, you know where is this relative to our inertial space? So a highly inclined orbit um, is one that you know circles up above the poles. And uh, a low inclination orbit or a zero inclination orbit is one that goes around the equator. Geostationary orbits are ones that are big. They are about 36,000 kilometers in altitude. And they, which is, you know, that's our, that's our furthest regime. That's probably as far as we go if, it, if we're going to keep it around Earth. And uh, they stay completely, they stay at the equator, right? So one, we, think, we know it's geosynchronous. Their orbits have been calculated so that their periods match the Earth's rotation. And, say, and they also stay at the same place above the equator on Earth. That's where our telecommunications, our direct TV, our Sirius XM satellites hang out. It's a big, it's the, uh, that's the Rodeo Drive of orbits, right? The FCC has to tell you if you, um, you have to buy space from the FCC to put an, or, put an object there, right? Our last thing, location in orbit, and this is just a little funky. Our location in orbit is really just an extension of um, an extension of our perigee direction, but this is our last thing. So if we have our perigee perigee direction here, um, I actually don't. I, I'm trying to use the perifocal frame, but I can't remember which one. P. P Q R. Hmm. Don't quote me on that. But this is our p direction. And then our, um, our radial direction goes out here. 
the angle between our perigee direction and where we are in our orbit that tells us how far we've gone. That is true anomaly, also known as theta star, also known as nu. I see nu a lot more than I see theta star, just a heads up. Um, and that's how it goes, right? I made a little table here. This is kind of our, uh, this is kind of all the, this is our six elements, right? If you want to define your location in 3D space, or at least your state completely in 3D space, you need six things. You need where you are, how fast you're going. And usually you can get away with that from doing R and V, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. You can also translate them to orbital elements, which is what we've done here. And these, are, again, are giving us our shape. These are giving us our orientation. And this is where we are currently. These change slowly. These change quickly. And when I say these, I actually just mean true anomaly. And when I say change slowly, I mean for when we're dealing with something outside the two-body problem, uh, which is sometimes the case and sometimes not the case. So if you are just looking at a two-body problem, these five, these top five will not change and only true anomaly will vary. If you're looking at something with perturbations, J2, uh, drag, uh, third body effects, you'll start seeing some drift in those other ones, but it will be slow compared to the true anomaly. So this little table is sometimes a little handy, definitely something to have on a crib sheet if that's available to you. And uh, hope you like this video. Hope it's gotten you thinking a little farther past, you know, just the textbook definition and is giving you a little, a little more to think about in terms of visualizing and, you know, what the implications of these orbital elements are. So thanks for watching. That's all I have for this video. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment, you can email us. And if you see me around, you can also just ask me then.